Hey everyone, so as promised, we're gonna go over the new NBP Workflow CL Pro actions in terms of the actual workflow stacks. Now that boils down to these three, technically five, but we've already gone over the first two. And those are pretty straightforward though, extremely useful. These three stacks are all identical on top of that. So really at the end of the day, this video is about showing you what the workflow stack does, or rather what you can possibly do with it, right? So, uh, you know, the reason why there's three, median, Gaussian, and surface is because those are our three different or most commonly used blurring operators or filters that we make our frequency separation process happen with, right? So many different things that we can do, but those are the three main ones. And of course, median is far and away the most popular one for lots of reasons, but the three options exist depending on what you're trying to do. Now, frequency separation by itself is an entire discussion. However, well, today we're going to talk about what you can potentially do with this workflow stack. And if you've never done anything like this, you might be able to brainstorm some ways you can benefit. Now, of course, for portraits, which is my forte, it's hugely beneficial. However, you can apply this to landscape or product or architectural or things of that nature. You can definitely do it. Nature photography in general, all kinds of things. So what, what does all this mean? What, what is the point of this layer stack? Well, let's see. MVP, median, frequency separation, chroma, luma, dodge, and burn. What this is, I'm going to go ahead and run it. It's going to let you know that you probably should start from the background layer or a flattened version of the image, depending on what your workflow is. You might want to start from the very, very beginning or duplicate the background and then run it on that. But you still need that raster data to create frequency separation, among other things, right? So we're going to get it run. Now, of course, you have to decide on the median, the blurring amount, right? And we've talked about this too. There are videos that we have about frequency separation in general. I'm going to go ahead and just leave it on 10. And then it's going to do a separation and then set up the rest of the stack. Now, let's talk about the stack. We've talked about it in the overview video, but we're going to talk about it a little more detail today. So uh, just like everything else on this action set, you can always close this folder and tuck it away <laughs> if it gets overwhelming or if you don't need to mess with it at the moment, okay? Or if your layers are getting out of control. But let's talk about what's happening. Now, one of the first things that I recommend that you do when you set up this layer stack, let me close this real quick. One of the first things I recommend that you do is turn off the chroma layer. Chroma just means this is where the color is hidden, right? So we extracted the color and separated it out. We hold down alt or option and click the little eyeball we can see our chroma information, which is super interesting because for example, if you look at this shot, I guarantee you, you're thinking blue jeans, right? But then you look at the chroma and you see there's actually some purple, some magenta in the jeans. And that's because this is just pure um, saturation and color information or hue information, I should say. So because of that, we can we can see and we can preview our colors. That's, that's cool, but that's not really why we have chroma here. One of the reasons why I have it is simply to protect the color while I do other things. You see, in my workflow, and you don't have to do this, but in my workflow, I tend to do my corrective things. I'm gonna turn off chroma. My corrective things, whether it's frequency separation, which is set up down here, or dodging and burning, I tend to do it in black and white with no color information. Now, historically, we can put up a desaturation layer or just a hue and saturation layer with desaturation all the way down. That's obviously very useful, but by separating chroma by itself on top, a, it protects it a little bit better, and B, we can also modify it. We talked about it a little bit in the previous video, but let's go ahead and kind of zoom in here. Let's look at the genes, all right? So we turn on our color, we see genes here. Now, a very common thing that we do with frequency separation is smooth out fabric. Never mind skin work, but we, you know, we can smooth out fabric and we can do all kinds of things. Oh, by the way, on this specific shot, you see the floor is kind of a situation. I didn't love the floor, but I had to just roll with it and that's fine. Um, this would require for me like extracting the subject, rebuilding the floor, painting around, uh, maybe some healing depending on what I was trying to do and still keep the shadows in there and making it look realistic. That is a lesson unto itself. We're not going to mess with that right now. Okay. But let's say we want to smooth out the jeans wrinkles just a little bit. Okay. So the color information is there. You can see it. The, the wrinkles exist somewhat in the color shifting, mostly because the shadows play with a little bit of color. Um, because in my my memory, I think I added a little bit of purple into the shadows in Capture One when I did this. So because of that, there's a little bit of variation. However, I turn off the color and I simply look at the genes. Let's say I come here to Luma Paint. There's things we can do, but let's say I come to Luma Paint and maybe like a 5% flow just to get me started. Color's off. So when I sample some color here, it's really just gray, right? So let's say I come down here and I sample some gray and I paint the gray 
and I'm slowly smoothing it. You can dodge and burn this. You can do all kinds of things here. Um, you can work directly on the high layer or the low layer. You can use the mixer brush on the low layer. So many different options. I'm going to kind of overdo this just a little bit. I'm resampling because I'm trying to trying to blend it and make it look halfway real. But you notice that I'm doing everything in monochrome, in black and white and gray. So there it is from there to there. I've smoothed out the texture. I can turn on the color and see what it's looking like. Okay, it's not bad. But you notice if I turn this off, you see the shadows come back. Let's zoom in for you guys. Okay. This is a common thing that happens. You look at it and you go, okay, I smoothed it out, but I've got these weird purples. That's kind of annoying. Well, you could fix it quote unquote later, or you could go right now, chroma paint layer clipped down. I'm gonna put it like a 10% flow and I'm gonna choose sort of a mid range blue here. And then I'm gonna paint over that purple shadows. See, so I went from there to there. Now. I can, I can do it less, I can do it more, I can change the opacity to make it look more real, but you can see the possibilities here. The color is separate. I can turn off the color and go back down to what I was doing. All right, let me see, that fix is a little bit strong. I'm gonna make it 70%. Okay, cool, come back, back to my color. It doesn't quite look like the rest of it. L let's say that section of denim is all I wanted to mess with. Okay, well, I can just take the chroma paint layer, not the chroma layer, the chroma paint layer, and kind of scale back the opacity on that. Maybe, let's see. Mm. It's so hard to tell in the video. I'm trying to get a good example. There it is nearly off. And there it is on. Let me see if I can just zoom in. It's so subtle. So if I turn that off, you'll see the purple tones. And now they're gone. So it's probably a little strong. So I'm going to go to 50%. Zoom out a bit. And then now, if we look at everything, for example, turn off our layer stack, turn it back on. You see how we smoothed out the denim. And with a real effort and the right effort and the right work, I should say, the right, the right uh, methodologies, we can make the jeans look as smooth as we need or as smooth as we want or even just a little smoother. Okay. And it does not entirely matter. Now, of course, you can, you know, you can do all kinds of things. Let's say the chroma paint layer is a little strong, but you're going to do lots of varying chroma paint layers. You can clip another one, another brand new layer if you want, or you can create a mask on it and then use black with like a 10% flow and just scale back the areas that look a little fake. Something like that. So you went from there. It's hard to see on the video, but there it is. Just kind of tone down some of that because it was looking a little bit fake. Okay. While I'm here, I can still do skin work, you know, not that she needs really any, but you know, I could, I can go to my healing and I can come to my healing spot healing brush here on this layer make sure it's not on sample all layers and just kind of do a little basic healing here and there are no fly, fly away hairs to speak of, but no matter. Basic healing in there, cool. I can come to Dodge and Burn right now. Nice soft brush, turn off chroma temporarily. Maybe a nice 1% flow and do some basic dodging and burning without color information distracting me. Just kind of clean some of this up. Like I said, she doesn't really, you know, quote unquote, need any <laughs> to say the least, um, but no matter. Let's say I wanted to do some dodging and burning. Something of that nature. See, it went from there to there just to smooth out some of these areas right here. Slight darkness under the eyes, just barely. And then turn on the color again. And there it is. So there's our dodge and burning. Okay, there it is on, off, on. And we have that. And we can come back up here since we did not take our, our sort of stamp down layer there, our chroma paint. We did not change opacity. So now we can come in and choose like a mid-tone color here and cover over the areas that were maybe not quite what we wanted. Something like that. And again, we have that layer, the mask, excuse me, if it's too fake here and there. You see how the whole point here is the flexibility. So from off to on, that's the entire edit. Let's go back. Let's look at the jeans and her face. So off, on, you see that? What I'm trying to do is create, on what I've done, is create a layer stack that allows you to kind of do everything at once frequency separation, dodge and burn, and then color correction. Now, this is not necessarily where I would say you would um, do a serious fix, like if you had a major crease or a rebuild or something like that, or swapping out a face or whatever, maybe not so much this, but for specific tasks, this can be very, very useful even on rebuilds. However, this was created with the idea of a general workflow in mind. It gives you all the tools you need upfront to Again, correct. Usually I turn off chroma like 99% of the time. I turn that layer off. I work in black and white, whether I'm doing healing on the frequency high layer, 
mixer brush in the low layer, painting in between. I can also add multiple layers in between. That's just frequency separation. I can do anything I need with these layers. I can dodge and burn on top of that. Order of operations is important there. If you dodge and burn first and then paint underneath, you might see a funny result. You should definitely try to go frequency separation first, then dodge and burn whatever you need. Turn on your chroma and see what happens. Because often when we dodge and burn or frequency separate, um, we'll see color shifting when we start you know, compensating for shadows and, and things of that nature. We brighten areas that need to be dodged and burned, as it were. And we see some color shifting there just because of the nature of physics and the way it captures light um, in, in, in a camera sensor. So because of that, we go, ah, oh, well, the dodge and burn looks okay, but I see some greens in the shadows that I have recovered. Don't know if I like it. Well, cool, turn on chroma, use your chroma paint layer and go for it. I mentioned earlier, you can make another layer, hold down alter option, click in between and just paint down again. And the reason why we do the clip down, same thing with healing here, frequency separation, just as a refresher, if you don't know, is to protect the original layer. If we make a complete mess of this layer, we can literally delete it and start over. <laughs> okay, so that's why it's good as opposed to painting directly on your chroma layer. It will work, but it's a good idea to protect it just to kind of give you some insurance to scale back in case in case of the, what you do ends up a disaster, right? Okay, so you can see how I've expanded the workflow here. I've added layers of wherever I need them to make things happen. It, there's so many options with this workflow. And here again, if you're like, okay, I like where this is at. Close the folder or flatten to a new layer, whatever you wanna do, flatten the whole thing, it's up to you. Close it and then continue on with your color work maybe, right? So many options beyond that, depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah, you might flatten to a new layer because you're going to use a plugin of some kind, right? You might flatten to a new layer just to keep things even and, and, and on the pixel level. You might completely flatten because that's just your workflow. Boom, now I've cooked in all my edits. It doesn't matter. I'm going to undo that though. <laughs> the point is this layer stack is not as intimidating maybe as it seems. I'm going to delete it real quick and just kind of, let's go ahead and run uh, Gaussian. Same exact story. I'm going to start from the background. I'm going to use a small Gaussian, like a two. And sometimes I'll use Gaussian at a small radius for very specific little things here and there. And, and again, that's a frequency to separation discussion, which I've had many times, but probably going to make some more, more videos about that too. But as you can see, by having this, uh, you know, multiple ways of splitting up, we have high frequency separated from low. We can look at these actually. Here's low, which barely can tell because it's just lightly blurred with the Gaussian. There's low. Here's high, which if you haven't seen frequency separation, you're probably confused by this, but there it is, okay? And then here's the chroma information. And then by itself, if you turn it off, excuse me, if you turn off, um, well, actually I don't have the Luma information um, by itself. I don't have a composite of the Luma because the Luma has been split into frequency separation, but this is basically the Luma, just with a slight blur. And then in between, I have dodging and burning to do any dodging and burning work I want to do. In theory, you can add anything. If you're here working and you think, hey, this is going okay, but uh, I need a brightness and contrast right here. And I need to add contrast to something, maybe a whole lot of it. And I'm gonna invert that mask and then paint with white just somewhere specifically. Throw it into the middle of your workflow, why not? You still have the color protected on top, right? So all these, you know, sort of brightness or luminosity changes can be done underneath what the color is always protected. So these changes are also Chroma Luma split savvy. You don't have to change the blend modes or anything like that. You don't have to switch to luminosity because there's no color information underneath to change. It's all protected on top. So you see what I'm saying here? This is a decomposition of an image so we can address things that we want to fix quickly. That's mostly what it is. This is a fix situation. Once you fix what you want and you feel like, okay, I like it. I've removed the distractions that I didn't like in terms of, you know, usually for me, it's going to be skin, of course, but cloth and denim and things of that nature, hair, all kinds of things. Um, and then you can flatten, like I said, to a new layer and move on. And I'm going to repeat, in my case, this floor is a bit of a rebuild um, and I will handle that manually separate from this workflow because that's a whole thing, <laughs> right? But this can be applied to any genre of photography. You can set up this workflow and do all kinds of different things, even in architectural, even in product, even in, in whatever. There's just so many choices. Now, I encourage you to leave questions down below, please. I understand that this workflow if it's new for you, you might be like, hey, I don't want to abandon everything that I do and, and just adopt this. Okay, I understand that. I understand that. But at least try it. I think you'll see how it's beneficial. Now, it's kind of hard to describe when it's not useful, but you'll know. You'll know. If you get used to it, there might be some times you go, you know what? No, no, I don't need to do this workflow stack right now. I need to get XYD, XYZ done first, and then I'll go ahead and run it. You're going to figure that out as you go. However, 
this is my go-to. It's many of my students' go-to. Some have modified it, which I encourage you to do. I mean, these actions are modifiable. You need to add layers in there and you know how to do it, add them to the action. They're all there. So, you know, excuse me, the, the three different ones are there. So you can choose the different um, blurring operators or filters, but these stack exists, these stacks exist. So you can have full control of the different elements of an image to get things cleaned up quickly and conveniently without having to run multiple processes. That's the entire idea of this multiple decomposition. We could actually decompose it further and we might. I've been working on that for a while. Um, but you want to talk about an out of control layer stack? Well, we'll we will see. Again, I encourage you to leave questions down below.